Hare Krishna. Once again, beautiful people of YouTube, of the world, and of the internet. This is the Soul Ashraya podcast. It is actually a weekly podcast where we will seek the shelter of our dear Lord Krishna through prayer, conversation, and Shastra. I am your host, Bhakta Jake, and I am joined by my very good friend and teacher and truck driving extraordinaire, Balaram Shakti Das. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, Balaram, where are you today? Today, I am coming in live from Las Cruces, New Mexico. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We should do like a whole thing like, guess where Balaram is today? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I see it's very, very sunny there. Yeah. Yeah, it's bright. I'm actually kind of on a scenic overlook here. It's a pretty nice rest stop. I'm on my way to El Paso. So nice. uh, my guru is in El Paso. A um, bunch of God family is there. And um, because he just came back from India, so he's, you know, checking in on, on his babies. Yeah. You know, El Paso is, is really like his, his baby. He and a God brother of his founded the community here 10, 15 years ago. And it's, you know, they've been the spiritual leaders of that community. And it's just one of the most beautiful, heartwarming um, communities you'll ever, you'll ever meet. Yeah. It's just such a delight every time. So, uh, yeah, I'm just taking a, taking a day trip down and drive back tomorrow. Oh, beautiful yeah i i bet it is so nice you know i i feel like i've heard that new mexico is a very spiritual place i feel like everyone that i've ever met who's been there or lived there for any amount of time it seems like the um the veil between the two worlds get very thin out there in new mexico and it just seems like a very spiritual place. That's what I've always heard about it. You know, I've heard about the UFO thing. Like you can take a guided tour and look at UFOs all night. Apparently there's people that do that for you. They give you binoculars or a telescope and you can just watch them fly by all night. Have you heard <laughs> that? Have you, have you? I haven't heard that, but yeah, there's definitely people that go out and you know, call them in. It's, you can't, you know, it, it's, it's really about your consciousness. Like, you know, you're talking about the veil, right? What's on the other side, that's the subtle realm, you know, and there's beings on the other side there. And then there, there's another other side, that's the spiritual worlds, right? That's what, you know, devotees of the Lord are interested in. Um, but there's also the subtle realm that exists here in the material worlds. And there are beings that can phase in and out, right? Like Star Trek kind of thing. Yeah. It's a real, you know, it's a real thing. So yeah, there's subtle beings. And uh, and then there's you know, not subtle, like there's gross extraterrestrials as well. You know, um, all, all shapes and sizes, I imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But no, it's a matter sure. of consciousness. That was the point I was going to. It's like, if you tune your consciousness to them you know and call them if you know bill responds if you're you know friendly right that's what they say the, the good ones that is yeah. i don't know what you got to do to call in the not so good ones but i don't want to know <laughs> nah, i don't want i just want to i just want to chant my rounds that's all i want to do say my prayers and chant my rounds to the lord you know not uh call in like et you know yeah but anyway i i'm a hundred percent sure that that is a, a beautiful work that you're going to visit today and 
I mean, I'm completely intrigued by the people in out, out in Arizona. I, I would only imagine that the people out in New Mexico would be just as cool, you know, absolutely. The well, program tonight is in Texas. I'm just. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Yeah, El Paso. Wow. But yeah, so we have, there's a few devotees here in Las Cruces. I know Xavier is here. I think just like a couple others and they, they, they'll be there tonight. They come down. Wow. Um, but I think they also have maybe like, I'll have to ask them what they're doing here. If they're doing like regular programs. Okay. But yeah. They call it the land of enchantment. Mexico. Okay. Very uh, mystical place. Thanks. Is that, is that really what they call it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like maybe, Empire State. Yeah. New Mexico's we're, we're the Empire State. I am actually in Binghamton right now, which is like two and a half hours south of Rochester. You can come in. Come come on in. Come on in. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. So okay. yeah, this is my esteemed host here at the Airbnb. Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I wonder, are you familiar with any Vedic mantras, any like yoga mantras? Do you practice that? Yes, yes. I'm in a Kundalini yoga teacher training oh. right now, and uh, I'm certified in a, um, a Raja uh, yoga class. Um, so, yeah, I've been chanting for decades. Nice. Amazing. Well, you might be familiar with with the first one or two mantras are of our invocation prayers. Um, the first one is, um, what is it? I think it's called the 12 syllable Narayan mantra. And then there's the Guru Stotra, Omagyana Timurandasya um, mantra uh, for the Guru, you know, invoking the Guru. And then um, the rest, well, yeah, there's then pranam mantras. Uh, you familiar with the word pranam? Mm -hmm. Pranama, right? So yeah, it's just um, salutations to our, um, our sampradaya, our, our lineage, uh, namely Srila Prabhupada, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote the book that we're gonna be reading. And then pranam, to all of the Vaishnavas, all of the devotees of the Lord, and then um, the Panchatattva Maha Mantra and the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. I might recognize so, them and hear them. I don't know them by name. I mean, I know certain ones by name, like Mool Mantra and Gayatri right. Mantra. Yeah, these are different from the, the Sikh Mantra or the Kundalini Yoga Mantras. Uh, those are generally in Gurmurki, uh, which is a, like an offshoot language of Sanskrit. Um, right. Yeah, Mool Mantra. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. We'll, so we'll go ahead and chant those. <laughs> the first one is a uh, call and response. So, you know, you, you can, can listen. And, and check them out because I bring them right up. Sure. Yeah, come yeah. on. I don't want them to be on the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and then the rest of them will we'll chant in unison. Okay, let me let me bring them up here and share them for everybody. I'm gonna have my my own channel when I'm traveling called Road Yogi. Oh, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Awesome name too. Road Yogi. Right. Awesome. All right, Balaram, can you see him pretty good? Yes. Okay. Why don't you start him off for us, please? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo. Bhagavate, 
Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Agyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamne Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare Jai. Okay then I will bring up the text where we are at. Chapter 4 of the Krishna book. In case you are new to the podcast, we are in chapter 4 of the Krishna book. And this is what we read in this podcast. Oh, let me get, uh, get this set up. So Kathleen, do you know... Yeah, let's. We have someone new here. <laughs> so, yeah. do you know anything about the story of Krishna? Um. Yeah. Yep. We it, in my yoga teacher training, my Raja yoga teacher training, um, we learned a bit about Krishna. Pat, Patanjali was. Uh, I'll have to get the book of our lineage. Oh. Um, yeah. Pat, 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 Patanjali brought yoga to the West. Really. Okay. With um, was it Krishna Murthy? Was that Iyengar's teacher? Is that the same lineage? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. think right. Like yeah. So yeah. So that's that's the uh, Patanjali yoga system, uh, which is sort of a different branch um there's there's six schools in in india in the you know classical uh indian uh philosophy you could say you know uh one of them being yoga one of them being uh like logic you have atomic theories like science um uh and then there's a couple others um, one of them being um, karma mimamsa and the other being utma mimamsa. And that's like the first one just being literature on how to enjoy material life and the other being Vedanta, being the study of Vedanta, uh, which is the school that we belong to as followers of the compiler of Vedanta, who is um, Vyasa Dave. Mm -hmm. So, whereas uh, Patanjali, you know, the, the original Patanjali compiled the Yoga Sutras, Vyasa Dave compiled Vedanta as well as, which includes the Vedas. So, the Vedas are considered like the Bible of um, of ancient, you know, wisdom literature. And the conclusion of the Vedas. Um, is called Vedanta Sutra. You know, those are like the, the sutras, right? The aphorisms of, of Veda, which means knowledge. And then the, and then Vyasadeva, basically after writing all of this vast, vast body of, of scripture, you know, he was empowered 
by God to do so. Uh, he then was instructed by his guru to write a, a commentary on Vedanta Sutra, known as Srimad Bhagavatam, um, or the Bhagavat Purana, which is basically explaining all of the spiritual truths in the format of uh, questions and answers and dialogue and story, dialogue of stories, like how, how stories, you know, true stories um, of the Lord and his devotees uh, answer all spiritual questions. Because that's the absolute reality is there is the supreme soul and there's the individual soul and there is their relationship, which is called bhakti. Uh, and everything else you could say is illusion, right? It's, it's temporary. It doesn't have any substance in reality. Uh, whereas when we relate to the supreme absolute truth vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Lord, we're in reality. It's like if I'm having a loving relationship with Jake or with my family or if it, like that's, that's real. But if I'm ignoring them, like I'm living in the same house with them, but you know, like a teenager, they just ignore their parents. They sneak off on their own. Are they in reality or are they an illusion? Right? No, they're like living an illusion. Right. Uh, and their parents chastise them from time to time to try to, you know, correct them. So that's this, our situation in this world. You know, we're not, interfacing with reality uh, and then the lord personally manifests you know by his impersonal um energy you know the brahman or just spirit right which is the uh you know one goal of of yoga is to just get to that spiritual nature you know that eternal you know spiritual nature um you know, the Lord is pervading everything by that energy, but he also has his personal feature, uh, which he states in Bhagavad Gita is, is supreme. There's nothing higher than that. And in that, in those unlimited forms of the Godhead, Krishna descends to this world to do three things. Do you know what those three things are, Jake, from the Bhagavad Gita? They are to... Uh, no, I can't think of it right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, destroy the alarm. destroy yep. ignorance is one of them. I think. Destroy the miscreants. Miscreants. The demonic, yeah, those of demonic mentality. And the second one is kind of the opposite of that. To help the devotees? Yes. Yeah, to protect the okay. faithful. And then the third is to establish the principles of Dharma, right? Mm -hmm. To establish religion, uh, you know, the, the true path, right? And so uh, Vedanta is coming from that, from that, from the Dharma that was established by Krishna himself. Um, the other schools are not coming from that, you know? So the, um, you know, like logic, atomic theory you don't need to have a relationship with god to you know understand how debate functions right or how the particles of the universe function but uh so anyway that's that's a brief kind of introduction to that um to you know the schools of indian thought and where this krishna book comes in because krishna book is coming directly from the srimad bhagavatam so this is coming from Vyasadeva's personal meditation on Krishna. Vyasadeva was instructed by his guru to um, churn the cream of all the Vedic, all spiritual literature, all scripture, and present that. Mm -hmm. And so what did he do? He meditated on Krishna in, with bhakti yoga, with the practices of bhakti yoga. Um, which means devotion, devotional service. And he, he saw the Lord directly and all of his material energy. And then this is what he wrote down. Right. And so this is like the pinnacle of that book. This is the 10th canto, yes. uh, the story of Krishna. And so in this story, we're going to find so much richness of spiritual truths. And what 
we are looking at right now is a very interesting um, topic. It's something I've been kind of um, contemplating this past past week or two. Uh, and we discussed this with Rajras last week, was it? Yes. So um, well, last show. Last show. That it was. Yeah, I don't this, remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this character, Kamsa, who is basically a parallel of Herod in the Bible, right? This evil king, you know, who then, who, he, you know, understands that a divine child is, is to be born and he will be your downfall. So what does he do? He orders the slaughter of all the babies born in the last year, right? It's it's like the same, same story, yeah. Right, and then he doesn't kill him. He imprisons the the child's parents actually as well. It's like imagine if Mary and Joseph had been, had been caught, and he's like, as soon as that baby comes out of you, I'm smashing it against the walls of this prison cell. <laughs> like yeah. that's what was happening, right? Yeah. So he actually did that seven. What was this? Six times, yeah. six babies. Yeah. And then Balaram was the seventh and he got transferred to Rohini's womb, you know, so Kamsa just assumed it was a miscarriage. And then the eighth baby uh, was Krishna and, and Krishna instructed Vasudev to do, do the old switcheroo tactic and swap him out with a baby across the river, who is his divine sister. Do, yep. One of those, one of those. Yeah. And... <laughs> And now comes has come into the cell, and uh, the mother, um, Devaki, you know, was pleading with him. It's a girl. The prophecy said it would be a boy that killed you. Please leave her alone. And he's like, hell no. I'm killing that baby as well. You know, just totally took shelter of the demonic mentality. Does that make sense? Right. It's like our, you know. Our, our soul, you know, our spirit, our, our, our mind is always taking shelter of some energy. Yeah. Right? And so like yeah. our mind actually isn't ours. This is like a totally far out thing, but it's like this car that I'm in. It's not me, right? I'm using this car. I'm taking shelter of this car to drive down the highway. In the same sense, I, you know, I'm entering into this gross body and I take shelter of the various subtle faculties that accompany it. They don't come from me, the soul. They come from the material energy. And so we have to be very selective. And this is what yoga is doing. Yoga is the process of fine-tuning your selectivity of the subtle faculties that accompany the human instrument. Isn't it? Right? And then what do you do with those subtle faculties? Well, ultimately... The end of yoga is to worship the Lord. It's to engage your heart in loving, to be loving. And the ultimate expression of love is to love the supreme soul who resides within every individual soul, right? And so that is Krishna. Uh, so Kamsa did not understand that. He saw Krishna. He understood Krishna is here. You know, supposedly he's God. But I don't like God. I don't like the idea of having to be someone's servant because I'm Kamsa. I'm the king. I'm super powerful. You know, so I'm going to kill you because you're threatening my supremacy. Yeah. Uh, and I don't care what it takes. I will, you know, it's, it's like Anakin Skywalker. Like he would take on anything that would give him power. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, might is right. You know, I, you know, I have these desires and you know i i should be able to you know acquire whatever power i can in order to enact my will right i don't have to bow down for anyone you know, it's the same old story over and over and over again um with you know these evil foes and so he took shelter of a demonic mentality and in other parts of this book we'll see actually i think next coming up after this he's going to because he apologizes here and he's going to talk to his ministers and his ministers are going to convince him to again, take shelter of a demonic mentality and kill people. Right. But in this scene, he's apologizing. He's, you know, because he grabbed the baby girl and right before he could smash her brains out, she, 
<laughs> it's like, it's a PG-13 <laughs> uh, podcast here. She slipped out of his hand and entered into the sky where she assumed her eight armed form as Durga, the goddess, this, you know, the, the goddess of the, of the universe and chastised, you know, rebuked Kamsa. So you fool, you know, your, your killer has already been born, you know, na, 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 na. And, uh, and then disappeared. And he, he realized like, oh my God, like, you know, I am such, such a fool. Like I'm such a terrible person. Um, but what he, his apology here is very interesting because he doesn't actually own up to his sins. He says, well, you know, I killed your babies, but you know, we're not these bodies, you know, we're not, you know, we're actually the soul. The soul isn't doing any of this. It's just the material energy. So you shouldn't be mad at me, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, it's like if I, if I got in an accident, God forbid, on the highway, I could say, well, I wasn't actually the one that totaled your car. It was just my car that did that. And I happened to be in it. So, you know, you shouldn't be mad at me. You shouldn't punish me. I shouldn't be held responsible, right? It wasn't me, yeah. right? I, it wasn't me. Right? Kids always are trying to say that. So, so that, that was his line. And he's got, you know, I, I think we're at while Kamsa was speaking. Is that? Um, or are we the next one? When Devaki yeah. saw? Yeah, when Devaki saw her brother so repentant. Okay. So in the previous, par you know, a couple of paragraphs there, he's, he's, tears are flowing from his eyes and he falls down at their feet. You know, so he releases them. He feels very sympathetic, right? Showed his friendship for his family members. I mean, these are his family members. Yeah. Right? Uh, but he's still, he's not actually owning up and saying, you know, how can I actually serve you? Like, I want to, like, a real change of heart would say, okay, I need to take shelter of the divine energy, of devotion. You know, what is my part here? And, and let me not try to avoid any repercussions that I've caused. Like, I have to face reality. But he, he's still not able to do that. So it's, it's like a very, very profound lesson for us because we all have this Kamsa mentality within us, mm -hmm. right? We're always, I mean, just look at this world. Everyone is pointing a finger at someone else. Who amongst us is pointing the finger within and saying, I am the Kamsa. I am, you know, the, the one at fault, yeah. right? I should take the punishment like i'm not trying to avoid my karma anymore right so this is the mentality of a devotee right because they understand yeah of course we're not these bodies you know but we have the gift from god to inhabit these bodies and to you know be in this ocean of karma and be transcendental to it that doesn't mean try to escape it yeah and to be in it to own it and to use it as a vehicle for service. You know, I can, I could be on the highway with this car and be like, oh, it's a dangerous place. Why don't I just ditch the car, ditch the highway altogether? You know, it's like, well, okay. Or use the vehicle for service, right? It's, it's a loose analogy, but I, I kind of like, it. okay. So here we are now and we're going to hear about, um, David Key and Vasudev's response to their uh, brother, brother-in-law, uh, yeah. and his wicked mentality. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and, unless you have any, I'm sorry, I didn't ask if you guys have any uh, reflections or comments. Yeah, no, no, none. You, you, you got it lined up pretty good. I'm just going to start reading. Okay. Yes, queued up nicely. So let's see, let me just put the little floaty square over here. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. When Devaki saw her brother so repentant, she also became pacified and forgot all his atrocities, uh, sorry, all his atrocious activities against her children. Vasudeva also forgetting all past incidents spoke smilingly with his brother-in-law, Vasudeva, 
Vasudeva told Kamsa, my dear fortunate brother-in-law, what you are saying about the material body and the soul is correct. Every living entity is born ignorant, misunderstanding this material body to be his self. This conception of life is due to ignorance. And on the basis of this ignorance, we create enmity or friendship. Lamentation, jubilation, fearfulness, envy, greed, illusion, all madness are different features of our material concept of life. A person influenced like this engages in enmity only due to the material body being engaged in such activities. We forget our eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's so, so elegantly well-spoken and very nice to say that to a person who just killed uh, a whole bunch of your children. Yeah, talk about grace. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like just the understating tone of this is like, uh, that's why I want to do like a dramatic reading, you know? Hey, man, go for it. Yeah. But it, see, what's so profound here is they really get it, you know, and they're seeing this opportunity for something that it's perhaps hard for us to understand this mm. level of mercy. And I'm reminded, actually, a very good example in contemporary um, popular culture is uh, Les Miserables, right? You're familiar, it's like one of the great epics, you know, which came out of France, um, you know, chronicling the uh, French Revolution. Yeah. And when Jean... Valjean, the main character. I, are we? Are you both familiar somewhat with the story? Uh, yes, my esteemed host is familiar. I am not that familiar. Even okay, though okay. I know that they there's like a production of it. There's like a Broadway production of all sorts, it. all sorts of productions of it. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it's a it's a musical. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful, Jake. You gotta, you gotta it's it's one of I, the greatest stories ever told. I know I should be more cultured. <laughs> yeah. And why is it great? Actually, and this is again like getting back to like Bhagavatam, it's a story of the Lord and his devotees, right? So it's the story of the human struggle and the the grace of God mm, okay. shining into that, right? That is what makes something great, actually. It's like, I'm not great on my own, but right, it's my, by virtue of my connection. So it's such a beautiful story. It's this convict and his whole life, you know, he, he steals a loaf of bread because his family's starving, right? He's got starving kids and uh, he's, he's a desperate man and he gets locked up. And that sentence uh, never leaves him until the day he dies, mm. right? And so it's like his struggle and... One, the first person he meets after running, you know, escaping from the um, internment, uh, what do they call those? The, the, uh, the you know, forced labor. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I, I just heard it was 19 years he got. Like the chain, chain gain? Okay, yeah. yeah. So he got like 19 years of the chain gain. Yes. Uh, just breaking stones. And he escaped. And uh, he, he came to this house of a very humble friar. And the, you know, the, um, the nuns there were like, you know, kind of cursing him like, you know, you rascal, you know, miscreant, get out of here. We don't want anything to do with your kind. And, you know, the friar, I believe friar, anyway, you know, his father uh, welcomed him in with open arms and a smile. And had them feed him sumptuously, gave him a place to rest, you know, bathe everything, you know, gave him clothing mm. and just treated him like the closest friend in the world. Right. And then 
what does he do? He's still a desperate man. He steals two silver uh, candlesticks. Oh, wow. And anything valuable in the house, right? Everything is just very simple, but there's two silver candlesticks. Wow. Or wait, did it, maybe not the candlesticks. Um, he, steals, he steals something. Wow. And then not the candlesticks, though, because then he gets caught by the police and they drag him back there because they recognize oh you must have been you know at the the good father's house you know these are his things and so dragging back and they say you know good sir we you know we found this man you know running with with a knapsack of of your goods um you know give us the word and we'll basically you know make sure he never steals anything again right they would execute him and he says no no like um, you've got it wrong, my dear brother. Why didn't you take the candlesticks? I told you you could take the candlesticks. You left them here. And Jean Valjean just weeps. You know, it's like, what mercy is this? Not only it's you know, like Jesus Christ instructed, right? If someone asks for your shirt, you know, you give them your cloak as well, right? It's like so what is occurring it's like someone just committed a grave sin and not only are you forgiving them but you're giving them more as if they're your brother you're acting on the premise that we are all eternal souls yeah. that have a loving relationship that is the reality that i am choosing to live in and by living in this way like the 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 father understood he, he blessed him. He actually made him his disciple. And in that way, like later on in the story, he appears to him, you know, in a spiritual vision and he, wow. he's guiding him. He, he is his guru. Like that is what a guru is. Like they are there. They've taken wow. responsibility for your soul wow. and they will give you guidance. Like if they leave their body, that doesn't make them any less powerful. Right. In your life they, you know, uh, so he understands that this act of mercy, this act of grace is going to change the world. He has absolute conviction that, and what do you know it does? Jean Valjean becomes the most pious man, right? Because of that, you know, it haunts him. It actually, you know, that, that uh, father, his spirit of pure goodness haunts him. Wow. He can't understand how, you know, he could have, deserve that or you know would be worthy of such love and he ends up dedicating his life to being like him right so it may be difficult for us to understand how someone could be so merciful but this is the power of grace this is the this is love of god mm. you know love of god is manifest in their hearts so they're on the transcendental platform they understand who they are and who they are with the Lord. And so they're not concerned with the good and evil of this world, mm. right? It's the constant duality of, of good versus evil. And they're saying, we're, we understand, you know, you've done evil things. We're choosing not to play that game, you know, and we're going to give you, we're going to touch your heart with this experience. Um, so, yeah, so they're they're gonna speak some simple words to him, um, but they're on, they're really they're taking shelter of of the act of grace because why? Because that's pleasing to Krishna. You know, if they're they would be totally justified in saying, "Yeah, you really effed up, and uh, we don't really like you anymore. We don't consider you our our brother. You know, you should." <laughs> You should, you know, chant some Hail Marys there, bro. Like, no, they don't say that, you know, for, for you to just, because that would bring them down to his platform of the bodily platform. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll keep on reading, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Vasudeva took the opportunity of, Kamsa's benevolence and informed him that his 
atheistic activities were also due to this misconception of life, namely taking the material body to be the self. When Vasudeva talked with Kamsa in such an illuminating way, Kamsa became very pleased and his guilt for killing his nephew subsided. With the permission of his sister Devaki and brother-in-law Vasudeva, he returned to his home with a relieved mind. And sometimes a relieved mind is worth more than anything else in this world. Isn't that true? Mm. Peace of mind. It's either money or sanity, right? <laughs> Isn't that so true, though? So uh, this next bit here is kind of long. Um, I'll hop right into it, though. Time. What time did we start? Uh, 520. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, if you'd like to read. Absolutely. But the next day, Kamsa called all his counselors together and narrated to them all the incidents that had happened the night before. All the counselors of Kamsa were demons and eternal <clears throat> enemies of the demigods. So they became depressed upon hearing their master speak of the night's events. And although they were not very much experienced or learned, they began to give instructions to Kamsa as follows. Dear sir, let us now make arrangements to kill all children who were born within the last 10 days in all towns, counties, and villages and pasturing grounds. I feel like I should read that in like a demonic sort of voice, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, these guys are like, you know, yeah. you know, it's pretty bad. So let us execute this plan indiscriminately. They just want to mm. kill. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's crazy. It's, we think that the demigods cannot do anything against us if we perform mm. these atrocities. They are always afraid of fighting with us. And, they even, and even if they wish to check our activities, they will not dare to do so because of your immeasurable strength. They fear your bow. Indeed, we have practical experience that whenever you stood to fight with them and began to shower your arrows on them, they immediately fled in all directions just to save their lives. Many of the demigods were unable to fight with you and they all immediately surrendered themselves unto you by loosening their turbans and the tufts of their hair on their heads. With folded hands, they begged you to spare them and said, my Lord, we are all afraid of your strength. Please release us from this dangerous fight. We have also seen many times that you would never kill such surrendered fighters when they were all fearful their bows, arrows, and chariots broken, forgetful of their military activities, and unable to fight with you. So actually, we have nothing to fear from these demigods. They are very proud of being great fighters in peacetime outside the war field, but actually, they cannot show any talent or military power on the war field. Although Lord Vishnu... Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma are always ready to help the demigods headed by Indra. We have no reason to be afraid of them. As far as Lord Vishnu is concerned, he has already hidden himself within the hearts of all living entities and he cannot come out. As far as Lord Shiva is concerned, he has renounced all activities he has already entered into the forest and Lord Brahma 
is always engaged in different types of austerities and meditation. And what to speak of Indra? He is a straw in comparison to your strength. Therefore, we have nothing to fear from any of these demigods, but we must not neglect them, for the demigods are our determined enemies. We must be careful to protect ourselves, to root them out from their very existence. We should just engage our, ourselves in your service and be always ready for your command. And so, yeah, you want to speak to that one? Yeah, well, once again, you know, this topic of demoniac leader you know, might makes right and just indiscriminate killing. Yeah. Right? There's nothing more abominable than that. You know, it's, you know, we, again, you know, we, we see in all of these different stories, you know, stories that are telling about this battle between good and evil, that the dark side, it has no discrimination, just kill anyone that stands in our way. You know, no one can stop us. And this is going a little deeper philosophically because it's uh, directly speaking on the demigods who are the administrators of universal affairs. Yeah. <clears throat> and the Bhagavad Gita teaches us the path that the path of Dharma is to live in reciprocity, right? Like sacred reciprocity with the higher forces, you know, um, to you know, live your life as a sacrifice. And in that way, you know, the rains will come, they'll nourish the grains, right? It's like all <clears throat> very real things. Like I'm here in New Mexico, right? The Native Americans, that's how they lived in yeah. harmony with the demigods. They might not have called them Indra or what, but, you know, they had names for, for the demigods. Mm. Um, and they understood how nature works. And the, the demons, the demonic mentality is like, you know, doesn't matter who you are. Like, if you oppose us, we'll take you down. Like, we don't rely on nature. We don't rely on the cycle of life. You know, we'll take whatever we want. And, you know, if, if you don't like it, we'll, we'll either kill you or we'll, um, you know, tie a tie a band around your arm so everyone in society knows you know what what side you stand on will put you in a camp and you know right like you know the nazis did with the jews and you know so many peoples have done you know these yeah. different um atrocious acts to that is just completely um on the on the gross bodily platform you know conception of life yeah. uh, not having any kind of um conscientiousness that we are all connected like we cannot survive and it's you know in this kind of separateness and it's interesting because the next paragraph they're going to even speak on that it's like they can't even like hear the own their own, the words coming out of their own mouths Right. They're going to say, like, if there's some disease in the body, you know, becomes incurable, you know, best to, you know, cut off the, the disease. But yeah. it's like you're cutting off your own arms and head by going against, you know, the these demigods like Lord Brahma. That's that's the head of the universe. Right. Um, and Lord Vishnu is the heart the soul of the very soul of the universe. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, you know, they're saying that you all are the d disease, but actually they're the disease. Um, and what's going to happen. Krishna is going to cut them off from the tree of life. Um, of course, by doing so, he, he's going to liberate them. It's not like he doesn't actually kill anyone in that sense. He doesn't yeah. end anyone's existence you know the demigods think yeah we're going to end your existence right uh, and so yeah that's what we're seeing in the world right we look out to the middle east to um you know pakistan and um, places in the world where this violence is 
seemingly ruling the state of affairs. It's all the same thing. People think that they can create the situation they want just by killing. Mm. And yeah, so they're, they're actually taking the position of, you know, those who are very clearly labeled here as demons. Um, yeah. Wow. And yeah, so this, this story of Krishna is, like you said, you know, Vinatya uh, Chaduskritam, it's the annihilation or the, you know, purging of the earth of demons by the Lord himself. You know, personally, he comes uh, and, and we'll see the next few chapters, right, particularly Putina, you know, Trinavarta, like so many, so many demons come to uh, kill Krishna. <laughs> and yeah. it's just the way that he um, takes them out is, is so amazing because not only is it like, you know, victory, but it's also like incredibly enchanting, <laughs> right? Uh, because it's Krishna. It's not like, like Lord Ram, you know, he comes as this like warrior king to rid the world of demons millions of years ago and everyone loves him for that but krishna does as well five thousand years ago but he always does it in a way that just enchants your heart and it's like this this is the lord this is the real essence you know the heart of the supreme being is that everything he does is wonderful right everything he does is sweet right yeah. there's that one there's that one hymn about him uh, yeah. his face is sweet his his eyes are sweet his his dance is sweet his even his fevery is sweet his his killing of demons is sweet everything about him is sweet so all right well we are running short on time yeah we got about five minutes left. okay um what do you guys say any uh any discussion any comments or questions well i um i'm still amazed with the whole i am just amazed with the um the uh the presence of of durga in this chapter was really kind of like the highlight of the chapter you know i know that this chapter is really sort of like um durga versus kamsa you know like <laughs> that's really kind of like the, the culminating <laughs> And I noticed that there are literally like three more paragraphs left in this chapter, but I don't want to push them into five minutes, you know, but right. um, I, I think that we have done a really good job on this chapter and covering everything that really needed to be covered. And probably on the next show, we'll finish up and then we'll move on to bigger and better things. Um, more, much more focused on Krishna and how uh, how sweet he really is, and how amazing this book it gets yeah. so amazing too. It's Just, it's right there. <laughs> yeah, victory after victory, and sweetness, and sweeter and sweeter. So, um, yeah. Balram, did you want to uh, just me uh, mention? Um... Yeah. So uh, we we're talking before the show. Um, Vrajras didn't join us today because he is engaged in a special kirtan dedicated to his holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami who just left his body uh, today. Uh, so devotees all across the globe are holding extended kirtans and chanting the holy names um, in honor of him uh and for ourselves to yeah to really appreciate uh his immense sacrifice and the blessings that he has you know given us um he established uh over a hundred temples i don't know how many but uh, apparently hundreds of temples in india there's some like large cities that have like over a hundred temples just in one city, you know, mm -hmm. ISKCON temples. Like it's, it's astounding. Yeah. You know, so he had a massive 
impact. Uh, he, he was a massive role in the establishment of so many temples in India. I'm not so familiar. I'm actually not familiar quite at all. Um, that is just one detail I heard. And he's distributed countless books of Srila Prabhupada, and countless uh, sp spiritual literatures um, in, in, onto the world. And it inspired so many disciples. I don't know how many disciples, he was a guru in our movement. Right? And I'm not sure how many disciples he had, probably in the thousands, I would guess, in, in the thousands. Um, and he's inspired them to also be um, representatives of the Lord's grace, right? You know, um, yeah, just like, yeah. you know, the friar and uh, Les Miserables, you know, that's, that's, that's the role of a devotee, right? When we receive that grace, what is our duty, you know? Uh, and it, it goes beyond duty, right? Because it's just a movement of the heart at that point. You know, we, we serve because we love and we've been loved. So, so in that spirit, we will uh, end the show as we always do. And we'd like to dedicate these Maha Mantras to His Holiness uh, and to the hearts of His disciples who have survived Him. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Yes. Jaya Shri Krishna. All right, my beautiful people of the world, thank you for tuning into the Sola Shraya podcast. <sighs> Feels good. We please like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff that you do on YouTube. And we will see you next time. Hare Krishna and Hare Bol. We love you. Be safe out there. <laughs>